Very few stories are as tragic as that of former NBA star Javaris Cortez Crittenton. As a result of numerous off-field struggles, Crittenton's short-lived career never really matched the potential he showed both in high school and in college. Javaris Crittenton went from having a promising future as an NBA star who played alongside stars like the late basketball legend Kobe Bryant and six-time NBA All-Star Pau Gasol sees, to becoming a notorious gangster who faced a life sentence for charges of murder, possession of a firearm, and participation in criminal street gang activity. This is the twisted case of Javaris Crittenton. Born on December 31, 1987, in Atlanta, Georgia, Crittenton began his life's journey in a city renowned for its rich basketball culture. Basketball was played in almost every corner of Atlanta, and from a very tender age, Crittenton got attracted to the sport, and he was really good at it. Growing up in the impoverished neighborhoods of Atlanta, Crittenton faced challenges from an early age. He was raised by a single mother, and he learned the value of perseverance and determination in the face of adversity. Despite the obstacles surrounding him, Crittenton discovered solace and purpose on the basketball court. Javaris Crittenton's life was filled with promise and potential. All through his life, he was a straight-A student who was always at the top of his class. His good grades and morales eventually led him to being elected class president in the 9th, 10th, and 12th grades, as well as becoming Student Government Association president as a senior at Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy. At the academy, he honed his basketball skills and solidified his reputation as a standout player and an exemplary student. His exceptional performances on the court garnered widespread attention, leading to numerous accolades and opportunities. As a junior, in 2005, Javaris Crittenton averaged 28.4 points, 7.5 assists, and 8.2 rebounds. He also led Southwest Atlanta to the GHSA Class A State Finals, where they lost to powerhouse Randolph Clay. As a senior, he went on to average 29 points, 9 assists, and 7 rebounds, and led Southwest Atlanta to the GHSA Class A semifinals against Randolph Clay. After dismissing Randolph Clay, they headed to the championship game once again. This time, they were successful in beating rivals Whitefield Academy to become state champions. Following the season, he was named a McDonald's All-American, he was also named Mr. Georgia Basketball by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Crittenton carried a 3.5 GPA in high school and was a member of the future Business Leaders of America and the Senior Beta Club. As a standout player at Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy, Crittenton's talent caught the attention of scouts and coaches across the country. His athleticism, coupled with his ability to lead on the court, propelled him to the forefront of high school basketball stardom. With dreams of making it big in the NBA, Crittenton decided to forego college and turn pro, but he would eventually change his mind and enroll in Georgia Tech. Crittenton excelled at Georgia Tech and was considered a team leader, a rare accolade for a freshman. In February 2007, Tech coach Paul Hewitt even urged Crittenton to take over a leadership role on the team after his play in several games. He recorded a career high of 29 points in a February 13, 2007 game against Florida State. But after a single season, he left school to go pro. He was drafted by the Los Angeles Lakers with the 19th pick in the first round of the 2007 NBA Draft, fulfilling a lifelong dream. He always wanted to make it to the NBA, and finally, here he was. However, he proved that he wasn't yet ready for the big stage. Javaris had risen to fame so fast, he didn't know how to handle it. Soon, it all got into his head, and he began to party all too frequently, spending late nights out with friends. Javaris' newfound habit would lead up to the night that changed his life forever. One night, during his first off-season, Javaris went out partying at the Block nightclub, where he saw someone that caught his eye from across the room. It was famous Atlanta rapper, Dalla and his crew. They had flashy diamond chains on and were accompanied by beautiful ladies who had expensive designer clothes on. The mere sight of this had Javaris mesmerized. He loved what he saw, so he walked up to them and introduced himself, and due to his fast-spreading reputation, Dalla and his crew let him hang out with them. Later that night, Javaris found out Dalla was a member of a notorious LA street gang, the Mansfield Gangster Crips. Being a professional athlete whose career was just starting to take shape, Javaris would have just walked away, but instead, he stayed with the group and enjoyed the night. 
Following his new connection with Dalla, Javaris, who was attracted to the rapper's lifestyle, started hanging out with Dalla and his gang. In no time, the gang offered him the opportunity to join them and become one of the Mansfield Gangster Crips. And without hesitation, Javaris agreed, and a few days later, he became an official part of the Mansfield Crips. Crittenton might have been making waves in the streets, but his career in the NBA was an entirely different story. His time in the NBA was marked by inconsistency and off-court issues, which hindered his ability to fully realize his potential. Since he joined the gang, his career took a turn for the worse. No matter how hard he tried, his performance on the field kept getting worse. He went from the Lakers to the Grizzlies to the Wizards, all in just his first two seasons, unable to cement a place as a starter in all three teams. Javaris' fall was a thousand times faster than he rose, and in December 2009, his falling basketball career went completely off the deep end. It seemed as if he had hit rock bottom, but in reality, this was only the tip of the iceberg, as the worst was yet to come. During a team flight to Washington, Javaris decided to spend his time gambling on a few card games with his teammates, and after losing a couple of dollars, he got pissed, and in the heat of the moment, he got in a serious fight with his teammate Gilbert Arenas. Before the other teammates could get them off each other's neck, Gilbert made a surprising statement saying, I play with guns, and Javaris, being a Mansfield Crip, was quick to respond saying, I play with guns too. Not long after, the heated argument came to a halt. At the time, everyone thought the statements made during the argument were just emotions playing out, but only a few people knew how deep those words really were. On December 21, 2009, Javaris Crittenton and teammate Gilbert Arenas were once again at each other's necks. This time, they were involved in a locker room confrontation where they were both armed with guns. Once the other teammates noticed what was about to go down, they fled the scene and one of them notified the police. In an interview, when former Washington Wizards teammate Karen Butler was asked if Javaris and Arenas were really going to pull the trigger, he said, you never know, and that's the crazy thing about it. On January 25, 2010, Javaris Crittenton pleaded guilty to being in possession of an unregistered firearm and was given a year of probation on a misdemeanor gun possession charge stemming from this incident. Two days later, Crittenton and Arenas were suspended for the rest of the season by NBA Commissioner David Stern. Following his suspension, Javaris was released by the Wizards, and in the process, he lost his shot at the NBA while Arenas rejoined the team. Feeling like an even bigger failure, Javaris was at his lowest and felt like he needed the support of his family in order to feel like himself again, so he took the next flight back to Atlanta. On reaching his hometown, Javaris didn't get the support he yearned for. Instead, when he got home, what he got was pain and rejection. You see, the people who once saw young Javaris as a rising star now viewed him as a disappointment and a failure, and it was a tough pill to swallow for him. He had let them all down and returned home with nothing to show, so everyone considered him a big flop. With his hopes, pride, and heart shattered, young Javaris decided to return to the only people he knew would accept him, the Mansfield crib. They did accept him, and not too long after, Javaris became a ride-or-die member of the gang and was ready to do anything for the sake of the gang. But unfortunately, this sense of belonging wouldn't last long. Less than a year later, almost every member of the Mansfield Crips was either dead or imprisoned, leaving Javaris all alone once more. As a last-ditch effort, Javaris made an NBA comeback on September 22, 2010. The Charlotte Bobcats signed Javaris Crittenton to a non-guaranteed contract which he was later released from just three weeks later on October 15, 2010. In December 2010, Crittenton played five games for the Shijang Guansha Lions of the Chinese Basketball Association. He averaged 25.8 points per game, but due to a few issues, he returned to the United States after just a few weeks. In February 2011, Crittenton joined the Dakota Wizards of the NBA D-League. He played 21 games for the minor league team, including five starts, but he still couldn't make a good enough impression to be retained. At the age of only 23, Javaris was at his lowest, and with his frustration piling up, he was basically a ticking time bomb waiting for the right reason to explode. He was struggling to revive his career, but nothing he did seemed to work. The final push came on the night of April 22, 2011. While leaving a local barbershop, 
Javaris was robbed of everything he had on him, all taken by a rival gang member that he recognized as a 17-year-old ROC crew member, Trontavius Stevens, also known as Lil Tick. Well, after everything Javaris had been through, this was his last straw. He was not interested in the money. He just wanted to find Lil Tick and make him pay. And he didn't mean with cash. He needed revenge at least for the sake of his pride. On August 19th, 2011, Javaris was in the back of a rented car with his cousin, Douglas Gamble at the front, driving him to Lil Tick's last known location. Once they made a turn into the Macon Drive, Javaris spotted Lil Tick and opened fire. Ironically, just like his shots on the basketball court, Javaris completely missed and instead of hitting Lil Tick, he accidentally shot an innocent lady in the leg. Noticing what had happened, Javaris and his cousin immediately fled the scene of the crime. The lady was rushed to the nearest hospital, and only two hours later, she was declared dead, making Javaris Crittenton a stone-cold killer. The lady who Javaris mistakenly shot and killed was later revealed to be 22-year-old Julian Jones. Jones, a mother of four, was an innocent bystander who was unlucky to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. The bullet hole in her leg led to her losing a whole lot of blood, and later that night, during a surgery, she lost her life. Well, some of the witnesses could identify who the shooter was and immediately notified the police. The witness told the police he saw the basketball player Javaris Crittenton holding the gun. This was all the information the police needed, and with that, the search for Javaris began. He was arrested days after the incident by the FBI at John Wayne Airport in Orange County, California, on August 29th, while waiting to board a flight back to Atlanta. He would then go on to face charges of murder, along with other related offenses. Javaris Crittenton, who had played for teams like the Los Angeles Lakers and Washington Wizards, was now involved in a legal battle that would alter his future. The aftermath of the shooting sent shockwaves through the sports world and beyond highlighting the devastating consequences of gun violence and the importance of conflict resolution without resorting to violence. As the legal proceedings unfolded, the focus shifted to seeking justice for Julian Jones and her grieving family. While Javaris Crittenton's career in professional basketball had once been filled with promise and potential, it was now overshadowed by his links with a criminal gang and the shooting. On August 26, 2011, Crittenton was charged with the August 19th murder of Julian Jones. The Atlanta Police Department indicated that Jones was not the intended target. They believed that Javaris Crittenton was targeting a person who robbed him in April 2011. His lawyer stated that Javaris Crittenton, who was arrested while trying to escape to Atlanta, was actually on his way to surrender himself to custody. Javaris was later extradited to Atlanta to stand trial for the murder. He was originally charged along with co-defendant Douglas Gamble his cousin, who happened to be 29 years old at the time, with murder, felony murder, attempted murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime, and participation in criminal street gang activity for the August 19, 2011 shooting. Investigators said that the shooting was the latest in a series of revenge attacks, which the police believed were gang-related, in retaliation for an earlier armed robbery of Crittenton. In August 2011, Crittenton waived extradition after he was arrested in LA. One month later, he was released on a $230,000 bond, and in December 2011, Javaris Crittenton pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and aggravated assault charges in connection with Julian Jones' death. But while out on bond for the murder charges, on January 10, 2014, Crittenton was arrested alongside 13 other people after he was indicted in a drug trafficking case involving selling multi-kilo quantities of cocaine and several hundred pounds of marijuana. He was charged with two counts of conspiracy to violate the Georgia Controlled Substance Act. On April 29, 2015, shortly before his next trial was set to begin, Javaris Crittenton pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter with a weapon and aggravated assault with a firearm. He was sentenced to 23 years in prison in connection with the 2011 drive-by shooting that killed Julian Jones. The four-year NBA pro pleaded guilty to the crime, although he said he wasn't trying to kill anyone. Fortunately for him, his sentence was later reduced to 10 years in yet another deal with the district attorney. Following his resentencing, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office asked the judge in the case to revoke the resentencing. 
The office said that a senior assistant district attorney consented to the resentencing of Javaris Crittenton. They asked for a special prosecutor to be put on it if the sentence ends up getting revoked. But luckily for him, the sentence wasn't revoked. The plea deal that Javaris took helped him avoid a murder charge and led to a much lighter initial sentence, and on April 21, 2023, Javaris Crittenton was released from prison. Among the conditions for his release, Javaris Crittenton was instructed to complete 7,200 hours of community service during the first 10 years of probation by speaking to organizations dedicated to preventing young people from joining gangs. He must also wear an ankle monitor and adhere to a curfew for the first five years. During intensive probation, the curfew starts at 7 p.m. and ends at 7 a.m. every single day for the five long consecutive years. The news of the release of Javaris Crittenton reopened the dying wounds in the hearts of the family of the lady Javaris accidentally shot. When the mother of the late Julian Jones heard about this, she was far from pleased. She knew that the former basketball star who killed her 22-year-old daughter almost 12 years ago took a plea deal that meant he would spend less time in prison. But Miss June Woods had no idea that the Fulton County District Attorney had cut a deal to make Javaris Crittenton a free man even sooner. Upon hearing this, she told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that if she had been aware sooner, she would have spoken up then. It's not fair to her and to the late Julian's children. It's like a slap in the face to us, Woods told the outlet. If her children would have been out there, he would have shot them too, she added. Well, it's quite obvious that a whole lot of people were not pleased about Javaris' release. Not just the family of the late Julian Jones, but the media as well. But what's done is done. Javaris is finally a free man, and there's little to nothing anyone can do about it at this point. Javaris has a shot at a second chance to make things right. After being locked up for at least eight years, we're sure Javaris learned his lesson the hard way, and at the same time, we're curious to see what he'll do with his second chance at life now that he's free, especially now that it's basically impossible to pursue his dream as a basketball player. Will he seek refuge in his family once more, or will he decide to take the independent route from the very beginning? For now, the former NBA star remains on probation. This has undoubtedly been an intriguing video. The tragic story of Javaris has been both sad and disappointing at the same time, and we're all curious to see the oath Javaris Crittenton decides to take, how his new chapter unfolds. As usual, we're letting you guys be the judge of this case. Do you think Javaris deserved the second chance he got, or do you feel he should have served his full sentence? Let us know what you feel should have happened in the comment section. That brings us to the end of this video, guys. If you know any case you'd like us to cover next, tell us in the comment section. We'll be waiting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you in the next video.